morning and we are coming to you live from the Florida Keys. We're about three miles off of Tavernier floating around in the Atlantic Ocean. I have Mike T from the Florida Aquarium and Pam from the Coral Restoration Foundation. We're going to be going underwater very shortly and showing you what it looks like in the Coral Restoration Foundation nursery. So as they get suited up, you'll see Mike is donning a full face mask, so we will have communication with him. He can hear me through a microphone up on the top of the boat, and he will be speaking us through, to us with a microphone that is in his face mask. Pam, uh, Pam will be filming us with a lovely underwater torpedo camera, and we are going to be seeing them underwater here shortly. We are diving the nursery, so there are going to be a lot of coral trees that we will be seeing. This is the largest nursery that is dedicated to coral restoration. Enjoy your dive, Mike. We'll see you from underwater. As they get suited up and go in, I want to take this time to thank the Florida Aquarium, the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation, the Coral Restoration Foundation, and Think Out Loud Productions for allowing us to come to you live today. A couple of behind the scenes people today that you might not see on camera are Sean and Brooks Paxton from Think Out Loud Productions, as well as Nikki from the Florida Aquarium controlling the dive operation side. But I want to thank Pace Center for Girls in Pinellas County, Canterbury Schools, Learning Gate Community Schools, and Crystal Lake Middle School for sending in some really, really great questions today. Now trust me, we are rocking and rolling out here. We've got about 18 knot winds. This is not your typical easy dive day, but since we are out here to work and show you guys what we're doing, we're making every, every effort to make this possible for you today. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and switch, guys. We'll see you back when, underwater. All right, Mike, we are back live. How is the view underwater? Ah, uh, the view underwater is fantastic today. I'm sitting here next to one of the many, many trees in the Coral Restoration Foundation Nursery. We've probably got, I'd say, about... 40 feet of visibility. Um, Learning Gate Community School was curious as to how do corals grow? Well, some people think that coral is a rock. Some people think that coral is a plant. But actually, coral is an animal. This is a live animal that's right here next to me. And corals start off as a small sperm and an egg in the water column and once they get together they then need to find a place to settle down now if you take a look around me here there's a lot of sand and coral doesn't do very well settling down on sand so it needs to find a solid place in order to land once it does that small coral polyp takes root and starts to grow. Once it starts growing, it then takes in algae called zoazinthalae that's floating around everywhere in the water. And once it takes in that algae, it creates a symbiotic relationship where the coral protects the algae and the algae provides food for the coral. And then once the coral polyp is established, it simply starts growing and splitting off and will eventually create an entire colony of coral, just like you see right here. Good to know. Now, Canterbury School had a huge list of questions, all relating to the nursery itself. So I was wondering, is it at all possible for you guys to do a demonstration of what it looks like? when you take a piece of coral or a coral fragment and how you plant it and all of that good stuff? Absolutely. So our camera person, Pam, is an expert at that. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take the camera 
and I'm going to film Pam, and she's going to walk us through how they go through creating a frag and then hanging it back on the tree, as well as getting a larger piece ready for outplanting. All right, so we're going to experience a little camera transition under the water. And it just so happens that Pam went down with plenty of supplies to show how this outplanting process works. So Mike, just let us know when you are ready. She's uh, getting all of her supplies out right now. And as you can see, there's nothing, you know, complicated with the tools that she has at her disposal. So, she has these crimps, which are just little uh, metal ovals, and you'll see how she uses those in a minute. She's got fishing line, which is pretty heavy gauge fishing line. She's got a file, and that's used to clean the trees. You see these Tupperware containers, and that's the epoxy, which will which we'll see how that's used here in a minute. And there's all these numbered tiles. Now the numbered tiles are very important because we there's a lot of different uh, genotypes of corals that are here. And it's those numbered tiles that we use to keep them all straight so we know which ones are where. So right now, Pam is going up to the tree and she's simply going to take off a few fragments of corals. And then she's going to bring those back. And what she's going to do first, I believe, is go ahead and take one of the fragments and create other fragments of corals. So this is how we create additional coral colonies that we can hang back on the trees. So it's really important to remember that touching corals can cause quite a bit of damage. But Pam and divers like myself are trained to do it in a way that keeps the corals safe. And you'll also notice that when she does it, she's not handling the coral any more than she has to. So what she's doing now is taking the fishing line and wrapping it around the coral and putting it back through that crimp. I think this might relate to a question that Crystal Lake Middle School was interested in. What is the process to monitor the corals? Do you have to be in the water to monitor the corals? Yeah, what we do is, to go back to those numbers, those numbers tell us which corals are where. And then, once the corals are planted out on the reef, we then send a group of volunteer divers out to monitor them to make sure that they're still growing and still healthy. So Canterbury was also curious, how do you determine the species, the quantity, and the location of the coral you are planting? That is a good question. So the goal of this project is to reintroduce these types of corals into areas where they were normally found or they were found in the past. So what we do is we go out to the reefs where we know these corals have existed in the past and then we look for areas that don't have any other coral life around. Because just like animals on land, the corals do compete for resources. So we find an area that doesn't have any other coral, and then that's where we plant the corals out on the reef. And so as Pam is doing this, <laughs> I set her up as an expert, and you can see she's having some difficulty. Now the reason is, is because up top, we've got quite a bit of wave action going on. 
So we're moving around quite a bit here underwater. And they refer to that as surge, right? Correct. The back and forth movement of the water is surge. And so that's moving us around pretty well. And uh, making what would usually be a very, very simple task on the surface a little more difficult. But she's got it now. So what she's doing now is she's taking one of those numbers and then she's going to attach it to the frag. And that allows us to track that once it gets out on the reef. Now you can imagine, you know, that took Pam probably about a minute and a half. So you can imagine that if you had eight to 10 or 12 divers down here on the bottom, you could produce a lot of these fragments very, very quickly. And in one dive, it might be possible to actually outplant as many as 200 of these corals over the course of a long dive. So what Pam is gonna do now is she's gonna take the fragment that she's prepared and hang it back on the tree. I'm, I'm sure the fish and other animals down there will appreciate that. They do. They like having more places to hide, other places to bring in food. And you can see she puts a crimp on it, and now that coral can hang there and grow. Now these trees are pretty ingenious because even a coral on the reef, it can only grow up and away from the reef. But these corals on the trees can grow in 360 degrees. So they can actually grow faster than a coral would out on the reef. So actually, that leads to a really great question from Canterbury. Um, they were wondering, is, is your method of growing coral more or less effective than coral grown naturally? Yeah, you know, the other part about growing the uh, corals here in the nursery is that they don't have any other competition from other corals. And just like a nursery for trees or even a nursery for a baby, everything is as good as it can possibly be. So the corals here tend to thrive and do really, really well. But obviously the goal is to get them back out into the open water. Now in doing that, getting them back out into the open water, does that ever disturb the area or the marine life there? That's a really good question. What Pam is getting ready to do now is show you how we plant the corals out in the ocean. Now, as I recall, there was actually a really good question about, do you use a special kind of sand to plant the coral? Like you would use a special kind of potting soil for a plant on land. Well, it doesn't really work that way. So, Whatever corals need to be planted, we need to have an area that's pretty solid. Like I said, we can't plant the corals in the sand, so we have to plant them onto the reef. So we find an area that is devoid of life, so it doesn't have any other corals or anything growing on it. But there's even some small worms and things like that that can threaten a newly planted coral. So what we have to do is clear that away. So what Pam is doing right now is creating some balls of epoxy. Now epoxy looks a lot like clay, but when it hardens, it turns into a rock. So it's really, really solid. So she's going to make some epoxy balls and get those ready to secure the coral to the bottom. So the next part is pretty counterintuitive. 
she has to clear away the area to get it ready for planting. So what she's going to do is take her coral fragment and see how it lays. Then she's going to take the hammer and clear away any kind of algae or anything else that would prevent the coral from sticking to the reef. And again, remember, we're doing this on a dead reef. We're not doing this on a live coral reef. So she clears the area and puts the epoxy down where it needs to go and then takes the coral fragment and places it into the epoxy. Once it's in the epoxy, she smooths it up around the coral fragment and now it's secure and ready to go. So in a number of months, that coral will actually grow over the epoxy and in about a year, you won't even be able to see the epoxy anymore. That is fascinating. Now, we had another really great, great question from Canterbury about acclimating corals. Now, since we're moving them from the nursery to reef areas, is there an acclimation process involved? Man, that's a great question. Yeah, just like you would acclimate a fish to a new tank if you were bringing it home, you think you might need to do the same thing with a coral. Now, we talked a little bit earlier about taking corals from the ocean into a tank. And in that case, yes, you would need to acclimate it just like you would any other fish or any other animal. But the beauty about having this sort of uh, nursery in the open ocean is that it's all the same water. So any of the corals that you might find here, when we plant them out on the reef, we just simply take them out and we're good to go. Pace Center for Girls in Pinellas County was curious about how long does it take for the coral to grow big enough to be put back on the reef. We're seeing your your nursery trees, but how big does it really need to be? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So this coral, when it's hung up in the trees, may be only as big as a couple inches long. But this particular species of coral, called staghorn, was chosen to, to be here in the nursery because of how quickly it grows. You might have heard that some species of coral only grow a quarter of an inch a year. But this coral right here can grow much, much faster. So something like this, that's this big, might be as, as only uh, two years old. So in, in a matter of two years, you'll get something this size. But in general, anywhere from nine to 12 months, you'll get a fragment from this size to the size that you would plant out in the, uh, on the reef. So what we're gonna do now is, if we were going to go ahead at the coral that we simulated uh, planting here, if we were actually gonna take that out to the, the reef, we would grab a bundle of them. So a bundle of about 10, transport them back to the boat and go ahead and take them to the reef. All right. Now, when you get them out to the reef, how do you watch out for these little corals from predators and things like that? That's also a good question. So corals, uh, when we put them back out on the reef, we choose an area that we don't have any other things around that might injure them. But in reality, it is the open ocean. So we do our best to put them in a place that gives them the best chance. But in reality, they've got to learn to live on their own. So Pam's going to go ahead and grab the frag and and then go ahead and swim back to the boat. And we have our, our supplies ready up here, our bucket with water for that fragment when you're ready. Fantastic. Pam is swimming off into the murky depths. Wait, right, I thought you said visibility was good. Uh, actually, it is. She's about 20 feet away, and I can still see her, so that's great. <laughs> 
So I'm going to go ahead and start making my way back to the boat. So we're going to see Mike coming up here shortly. I want to thank again the Florida Aquarium, the Coral Restoration Foundation, the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation, as well as Think Out Loud Productions for allowing us to join you guys today from the Keys. We hope to see you back at the Florida Aquarium really soon. My favorite part about doing projects like this is the sense of exploration. Even in sites like this that we've been on before, you never know what you're going to see when you get down there. But being able to broadcast from underwater, four miles offshore, is something that you don't get to do every day. I think the importance of projects like this is the educational outreach that we can share with people that, that don't have the opportunity to see the ocean, let alone be in the ocean. I think educational opportunities like this are important because it shows what can be done out there. This series is presented by the Florida Aquarium with generous support from the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation. We thank you for watching. For more information or to donate, please visit us in downtown Tampa or online.